Good afternoon. So throughout 2022, we've been experiencing as a community a much higher number of gunfire incidents than we have historically. Ending this spike in gun violence is the city's highest priority. As both Chief Murad and I have said before, if you commit a gun crime in Burlington, we will do everything we can to hold you accountable. The city is making good on that commitment to the public and to the perpetrators of gun violence. Today, two people responsible for last weekend's homicide are now in custody. This is the third week in a row in which we've made major arrests for recent gun violent incidents. I want to thank Chief Murad and Lieutenant Jim Treeb, who manages the, our detective unit for the excellent police work that has made these arrests possible. I also want to thank the many law enforcement partners, including a couple that are here today, State's Attorney Sarah George, and then Alex Schmidt, who is the regional agent in charge for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, uh, for uh, their partnership. These aren't the only partners that we've been working with, but these are a couple of the most important ones. Um, uh, I'm going to hand over the podium to Chief Murad, who is going to share more details um, about yesterday's arrests and then the chief and I will have a broader update on our current understanding of the factors that are driving this spike in gun violence and on our efforts to bring them to an end. Chief, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging uh, uh, the, the work that was done both inside this building and by many, many partners. I had hoped that our uh, detective lieutenant commander, um, excuse me, our lieutenant detective commander, Jim Treeb, uh, would be here. He is, he is not, he doesn't like to stand in front of cameras, but his team did absolutely extraordinary work on this, extraordinary work. And some of those men and women are in the back. Um, they are, uh, they're right up there with any detectives you can imagine across the country insofar as being able to handle a case like this. But we didn't do it alone, and I want to express great thanks for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, speci specifically uh, Agent Alex Schmidt here, who is the leader of the ATF in this region. Um, tremendous partnership with members of the ATF who uh, are at these scenes, who do work that uh, that help us uh, uh, immeasurably around particularly ballistics, evidence collection, um, a lot of technological assistance, and just being able to work with federal partners. Um, the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, uh, Homeland Security Investigations, or HSI, the Vermont State Police, both their patrol resources who assisted uh, in the response to the incident on the night of the incident, and their Northern Investigative Unit, the South Burlington Police Department, who also responded in the aftermath of the incident and assisted with scene security, uh, but also have assisted in uh, the search since. The Vermont uh, Department of Motor Vehicles Enforcement and Safety's Investigations Unit, which we leveraged in order to uh, determine the vehicle that we associated with this incident. The Swanton Police Department, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, or FBI, the Chittenden County State's Attorney's Office, who oversaw the production of our search warrants, uh, the production of, our, of the affidavits that came out of our detective bureau and has now uh, been able to arraign both of our uh, involved persons um, and get holds without bail for each of these individuals. The Winooski Police Department and the Franklin County Sheriff's Officer, excuse me, office. Um, yesterday we arrested Christopher Crawford, 42, for the murder of Brian C. Rogers, 32. Uh, a person that we also believe was associated with the crime, Joseph Craig, was also arrested yesterday. Uh, today, Mr. Crawford was arraigned and held without bail. Um, he has a long criminal history in other states, including eight felony convictions in the state of New Jersey. The affidavit has been filed uh, at the arraignment today, and the summary of our case is this. Uh, that on September 4th, 2022, Brian Rogers was murdered in City Hall Park at approximately 0041 hours, so just before one in the morning. He was shot twice in the back of the head from close range without any warning or immediate preceding event. This was witnessed by his girlfriend who uh, was sitting with him at the time of the attack. Um, and it was recorded on security footage uh, that is on the Burlington City Hall. The path and the actions of the perpetrator uh, in the moments prior to this, and a, a long period of time prior to this, 
our uh, the basis for our affidavit. Um, we were able to detectives were able to look at his progress uh, through that part of the downtown um, all the way up until the moment of the murder, and then also to assess his flight with associates in a vehicle. Um, this was, however, a an incident in which we did not have a lot of information. We didn't know who our we, our suspect was. Our victim was relatively new to us and new to the city. Our suspect is was new to us. This was not akin to many of the other gun violence incidents that we have dealt with over the past two and a half years. Most of those spring out of uh, immediate altercations. Many of those are associated with a small group of people who are local with whom we have previous law enforcement engagements. This was not that. This was a, a, a in the terms of, of law enforcement and police books, a stone cold who done it. And the officers here did a tremendous amount of work in order to uh, find this individual and be able to then go out out and canvas for a vehicle, find that vehicle with the people in it and actually make an apprehension. This was extraordinary work by our detectives. And it comes on the heels of a workload that is absolutely unprecedented in the history of this city. We have never had a period of two and a half years where we've had 49 gunfire incidents. We've never had this kind of volume where these detectives have been working basically, unfortunately, almost every other week there has been some kind of gun violence incident that has needed investigation and needed the work of a detective bureau that is uh, understaffed, uh, similarly to the department as a whole. They dig in and they do the work. Um, I am tremendously proud of them for, for doing this kind of, of work. Um, I'll take additional questions, uh, and, and the state's attorney is available for questions about this specific case as well, before we transition into a, a presentation and a discussion of the overall picture of gun violence as it's existed in Burlington since 2012 when our computer system was first implemented and we've been able to track the data, but more importantly since 2020 when we really saw something change, uh, something drastic. But for the time being, we'll take questions about the, uh, the case in, in, uh, in front of us. Uh, just to start, um, obviously on Saturday night into Sunday morning, state police was in town, um, and you know, as many of us know, they were kind of located on that Church Street side. The shooting happened in City Hall Park. I mean, if state police is going to be in the city as a deterrent, I mean, did it not work this time? So, uh, well, we have a homicide, right? So, um, obviously, we we had somebody who was brazen enough to walk past police officers on two occasions moving in a circle uh, in order to get to where his, his target was to assess that there was not coverage in that immediate vicinity, even though it was right there on the other side of the buildings that uh, are on the east side of City Hall Park and on the west side of Church Street, uh, and make a, make a decision to, to take this individual's life. Um, there were a number of, I had called in the Vermont State Police again, um, as I had on August 13th. On August 13th, it was predicated on the fact that we'd had a double shooting the night before, a shooting for which we made an arrest and have uh, apprehended a suspect. Um, but uh, in the wake of that, we, we called in the Vermont State Police to assist us. They sent 10 uh, Vermont State Troopers. Um, on this particular occasion, this was about the fact that it was a Labor Day weekend. Uh, it was the first full weekend where the students uh, for our, our colleges had really been back. We expected a boost to the nightlife, and we wished to have a sense of presence, that, to project a sense that there is going to be a public safety presence in our downtown. Um, and so in discussions with uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety and, more importantly, uh, Colonel Birmingham of the Vermont State Police, we determined to, to make this request, ask them to come uh, and assist us on that night. We had a total of six troopers. There were five Vermont State troopers and one major. I was also there. I ran into you that night, Cam. Um, I know you know you were off duty, uh, but managed to, 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 to actually get a, a small piece out of it as well with, uh, with some cell phone footage. Um, we were there on, on the downtown. We were able to respond within seconds to the shooting. Uh, but this individual was willing to undertake this act despite the presence of that much law enforcement. And then that too separates this from many of the other incidents that we have seen. This was a very different incident and it was of great, great concern. And the fact that we did make an apprehension here and are on our way to having a, a strong prosecution is a great relief to me personally. I didn't see in the affidavit any indication of possible motive here, but still unknown. 
So that is something that we're still trying to determine. Um, and you know, motive is often important, but it's also incidental to an act. When you have the, the proof of an act, uh, why people do what they do uh, is oftentimes very compelling for uh, reporters and for television shows. It's not necessarily what we need in court uh, when we have proof of the act. And what we have here is a pretty strong case of being able to witness this individual do this act. Is there any reason to believe that drugs are involved in this somehow, some way? I know towards the end of the affidavit it mentions that you know, they were making trips back and forth from St. Albans to mm -hmm. here to St. Albans to here um, you know, with illicit narcotics. I mean, is there, is there drugs related in this case at all? I strongly su suspect that both the, the victim and the perpetrator are involved in narcotics trafficking. Uh, again, these are not people who are, are uh, long-term residents of Burlington. Uh, these are relatively new arrivals, um, and I do believe that that is a factor, certainly in their presence in the city, if not in this particular act. What is your message to the public? This happened in a fairly crowded area on a Sunday, uh, and you know, from the affidavit it shows like this guy walked pretty much up to this guy and tried to make the patient stand from behind. Um, I imagine residents and people in the area are pretty nervous about, uh, you know, this kind of thing happening. I myself walked downtown late at night often. Um, just what's your message? So my message is that we, when these incidents occur, we do every single thing we can to make certain that we find the person and bring them to justice. And we've been successful in that in more cases than not, particularly in cases like this. Uh, my, my message is you know, also that uh, the, the very next day, there were people in City Hall Park enjoying themselves, women, uh, families and children and uh, people with uh, you know, the, enjoying just a, a space that all of us can enjoy. Uh, that's a park that we spent a lot of money to, uh, to reinvigorate. Um, we have people here who, who do a lot of work with the park and making certain that it is uh, fully kept active with regard to events. Um, and those events do proceed. They uh, proceeded the next day. These incidents are awful incidents. We take them tremendously seriously. And the, the men and women inside this agency dedicate themselves to uh, bringing the people involved in these to justice uh, for behalf of the victims, behalf of our community. But they are also rare incidents and isolated. Even though we've seen a tremendous uptick in them, they remain small numbers. Uh, that may or may not be of, of some degree of comfort, but I know that our community is concerned about this. I know that people are fearful about what's going on. We are, are concerned about the direction in which uh, the city is going with regard to certain kinds of crime, certain kinds of incident reports, and particularly gunfire as well. You stated that um, based on the presence of state police that you guys were able to respond in seconds. So I guess during these peak hours when people are outside, especially with the college students, are we expected to see heavier presences downtown? I also know that the Burlington Business Association is trying to bring back their security details. So. Um, That's a great question, and we are uh, looking to work with, with any entities that want to create uh, and, and assist with creating a public safety environment in the downtown core and throughout the city. Um, are we going to see Vermont State Police again? Uh, not on a regular basis, by any means. This has never been something that was supposed to be regular. The fact that there was actually a relatively short, time, uh, short period of time between August 13th and uh, September 4th um, the third actually is when they were deploying, the incident occurred on the morning of the fourth, uh, was simply a, a matter of, of an incident that occurred and then a, a, you know, a holiday weekend. Will we see them again? It's possible if uh, specific conditions align, but it's not something on which we can count. Are we going to see Burlington police officers downtown more often? Certainly we're going to be doing what we can to focus on it with the resources that we have at hand. We're working to build those resources back, and that includes not just police officers but other kinds of, of resources. Um, in the meantime, yes, I do think that there are going to be explorations of other kinds of uh, other means of, of projecting public safety presence. And I don't know if you want to weigh in on this, Mr. Mayor, um, particularly around the BBA. Yeah. Uh, so the city um, helped fund that uh, BBA initiative last year. Um, there is interest in, in some kind of employee support program continuing again as uh, we get into the kind of darker part, part of the year in the city. Um, city uh, led by Kara al Nazrawi, the head of the Tertiary Marketplace and Business Workforce uh, <clears throat> Development uh, Department um, is, is working on that, yeah.
sounds like Craig, the alleged accomplice, may have been detained briefly on the night of the shooting. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't believe that's the case, at least not, not in association with the incident. Um, Did they spoke to him? Yeah, just been the shooting. So not a not a detention to my knowledge. I think they spoke with him, but I don't know that there was. I'll have to add actually if you've got more information about that. Well, if we can come back to it, I'll find the specifics on it. If you have another question. Yeah, the other question was, uh, could you uh, explain a little bit more ATF's uh, assistance in rolling this? Sounds like my cue. So. I'll get to that. I have a quick statement for you, and then uh, I'll, I will answer your question. So, uh, as the Chief said, my name is Alex Schmidt. I'm the resident agent in charge of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Run the field office here in Burlington, Vermont. We cover the entire state of Vermont from that field office right here in Burlington. Um, my agents have been engaged with the Burlington Police Department and others. Uh, on pretty much every one of these gunfire incidents that have happened in the city in the last several years. Uh, last weekend's violent homicide marks the 23rd gunfire incident in the city of Burlington. There's zero tolerance in the city of Burlington or anywhere else in Vermont for criminal gunfire incidents. The current trajectory of violent crime in Burlington is alarming, and we refuse to accept a reality where gunfire in downtown Burlington is the new normal. Together with our local, state, and federal law enforcement partners, we will aggressively and relentlessly pursue those who choose to violate that and put their fellow citizens in imminent danger. Through both new and existing partnerships, we will continue to leverage all our collective resources to immediately investigate those who willingly choose to pull the trigger in the city of Burlington. And we will bring them to justice to restore a sense of safety in a city that has been plagued by far too many gunfire incidents this year that goes well beyond this year. We will have further information on our partnerships and advances in technology, which we will share with the media in the coming weeks. To specifically address your question, uh, the agents have been, uh, and not going into too much investigative detail, my agents have been deploying with Burlington. They've been embedded with Burlington Police Department and other Chittenden County law enforcement, uh, as have other federal and state partners. They've been deploying on these incidents to sort of bring, you know, leverage our additional resources, our additional technology. Uh, we have some ballistics technology that um, we're going to share with you in the coming weeks that can sort of link some of these gunfire incidents together, which we've been utilizing uh, a lot in the last six to eight months on some of these incidents to link them together from an investigative standpoint. I go, can't go into it any more than that right now, but uh, obviously this is uh, it's not tolerable for us, and it's something that we're going to do everything in our power we can to sort of change the trajectory of this. And uh, you know, I think I think the results over the last couple of weeks speak for themselves in, uh, in closing out uh, a number of these recent gunfire incidents to include to include the homicide. I I, I uh, just viewed the video myself, and uh, to say it's extremely disturbing would be an understatement. Were agents um, on scene at the motor vehicle stop where the arrest? I understand. Uh, that is my understanding. Is that is that correct? Yes. To your first question, there isn't a lot more than that that we know, but that he was detained. I mean, they use the word detained. He was stopped by VSP as he was leaving the scene, I think, just to check for weapons. We, they will have acts on videos, so we will learn more about what that interaction was when we view that. But right now, that's all we know. Just uh, for Sarah, while, while you're at the podium, um, you know, we've seen obviously more incidents in, in the last month, month and a half. And seems as though as arrests are being made, most, if not all, of these suspects have been held without bail. I mean, talk to me about that approach and um, how the public should, should view that as well. Yeah, and I've, I've said from the beginning that as we get these cases, we'll take them ex as extremely serious as they are, which the, the most we can do in our legal system is hold somebody without bail. That is the most punitive thing we can do. It is the most punitive tool that we have. And we've used it in every single one of these cases where somebody has been arrested for um, a shooting incident. And we will we'll continue to do that when we have the evidence to do so. It is limited to a 60-day hold by statute, but our courts are now reopening, and so we can actually guarantee a trial in that time and plan to do so. Um, so my hope is that not only will these individuals be held, but that we will get to trial much quicker um, which always ensures a stronger case because they don't allow for a case to sit for years on end as evidence gets um, colder. So it's 
it's not only good that we have been able to hold them without bail and in cases where we've been able to have evidentiary hearings that the court has continued to hold folks without bail, but also that we can bring them to trial sooner. Is there a timeline on that? I know that uh, after the arraignment this morning, it's uh, pending the weight of the evidence as well as the statute uh, status conference, which would take the next step. But is there anything you can tell us about when this might all go to trial, when this might happen? No, it's hard to tell. Every case is obviously different. Um, homicides are going to take longer, of course, than you know the the Halale shooting that we arraigned last week, that, that hold without bail hearing is scheduled for the end of the month, and it's an attempted murder, so we'll go to trial sooner. Um, this one being a homicide will likely take some time, but it is an incredibly strong case, and we don't have to rely on witnesses. It is very good video, and so I don't expect that the, that the trial will be complicated, um, but I it will still take time for defense to review everything and for us to gather as much information as possible. According to the documentation, it's uh, Craig stated that they uh, had met, Craig and Crawford had met uh, sometime when they were both serving time. Is there anything more that you can tell us about that? Maybe how long they've known each other or how deep their relationship goes? Because I was just curious. I don't believe we, at least I don't have any further information about that right now. I'm not sure if the detectives have, but Right now, that's all we know is that they met in jail and that they have been interacting since being out. But I don't know when that was. Thank you. Quick question for the chief. Then. Uh, in terms Before of that, Cam, do you have any specifics on that, Detective Byrne, on the nature of that, that relationship between the two of them? Thank you. Um, obviously, we have the two that were arrested and arraigned. Is there a possibility of, of more people that were involved? I mean, we have this car. Was it just the two of them in that car, or were there others? I mean, is there a possibility that, that more people could get charged? Charged? I don't know. I believe that there may have been a third person in that vehicle. Um, but uh, are we prepared? Do we, you know, we don't know those associations yet. I think that we're confident that we have, we, we're co very confident that we have the person who pulled the trigger. Um, and insofar as a strong relationship with the other individual, we've got that as well. Whether someone was present in the vehicle or not is something that we're working on. So, uh, the, you know, the advent of the private camera is a recent uh, thing, and obviously there are cameras on uh, an increasing number of businesses. Uh, that stems from uh, the ease of availability of them, the low cost of the systems. Uh, it stems from, frankly, an increase in a sense of, of crime and vulnerability that is in the downtown. Uh, there are certain businesses that are more likely to have them, particularly bars, uh, particularly uh, as we move into a place where we're going to have, uh, you know, where we already have CBD and we have other kinds of marijuana and things. I think we'll see cameras on those kinds of facilities, certainly. Uh, and then the, you know, very few of these are cameras owned by the, by the city. Uh, these are private cameras and we have used them for a very long time. So cameras have you know, have been a key component of detective work for at least the past decade to 15 years, um, where, where a canvas, a camera canvas, is almost as important as knocking on doors and talking to witnesses. And in some cases, is better uh, and is a, a really frequent use of detectives' time. I know you've mentioned in the past, um, you know, with, with other incidents that the public's help obviously is, is crucial, um, you know, for an investigation. I mean, is that really what set this apart from, from other unsolved gunfire incidents and or homicides in the city, um, you know, with help from, from people that were there, with help from, from businesses. I mean, what, what made it so that you were able to kind of move quickly on this one? Uh, well, I, extraordinary work by, you know, detectives to be able to actually find these. It's just because these things exist doesn't mean that somebody can actually get them and figure out who's got them and then be able to collate them, to be able to go through them, to be able to actually put together a, a chain of movement. That is the work of somebody who has to spend a long time uh, looking at that and figuring out where 
you know, uh, watching uh, just sometimes uh, hours of video of grainy video that are not focused on our person, right? We're talking at times about a person whose whose feet or, or merely a person's head moving through a very corner of a screen. And that does establish for us a pattern. It establishes a path. It establishes presence. Uh, but it is not the same as having, I don't know, you know, take your pick of a TV show where, where the camera PTZs and, and, and pulls in on people and follows them in ways that are, are clean and easy to understand. This is really difficult work. Um, and uh, I think that in, we do want public assistance uh, when we can get it, uh, we, we need it. Uh, there are some cases that have occurred this year where we do have, we have injured parties who won't cooperate with us and give us information about what occurred or not. Um, and that is a real challenge for us. Uh, some of those cases ultimately become uh, sort of put into a bucket where we say there aren't any solvability factors, despite the fact that there's a, uh, you know, a victim, um, because there are simply not pieces of information there. I'd like to see a lot more pu public assistance in this. Uh, I've said very frequently that public safety is a shared responsibility, and we do need our, the public to, to help us on this, to collaborate with us on these uh, instances. And the feeling that everybody has around these, instance, uh, these incidents um, the feeling that it gives of uh, a, you know, we don't want this. Uh, and I think we all need to come together to, to work on trying to prevent it and, and get through it together. Is there any updates on Mr. Rogers' girlfriend? I know that you know, she was admitted to the hospital, or not admitted, but was at the hospital after, shortly after the, um, the shooting, um, being treated. Mm -hmm. I know that she had spoken with some officers and was able to give some uh, details as to how everything occurred. Is there any updates on her condition or how much she's going to be? So I spoke to her that night, um, and uh, it was it was my uh, assessment that I mean she was in terrible shock. Uh, this is it is unimaginably horrible to be sitting with someone uh, and and have suddenly that person murdered in your arms. Um, uh, I believe that her trip to the hospital was primarily around tinnitus, around a ringing in her ears because of the proximity to that gunshot. I can't imagine that she's, I don't believe she's still in the hospital for something like that. That's usually an assessment and then a, you know, a go home. There's actually not a lot that can be done for tinnitus oftentimes, unfortunately. Uh, with regard to other kinds of, of mental health, uh, for example, I think uh, I'll have to look into that and see if we've done any victims outreach for her. Um, what happened to her was, was awful, absolutely awful. She can was only there for a short period of time, but it appears to show all the resources, the officers in one place at the bottom of Church Street. Is, is, Does, was that the way you used it all the time? No, that, so I, I, would, I would say that that's not correct. I think there were a number there, but I think if you actually do a head count, you will not see six troopers in that video. You will not see the full, there were four uniformed officers of the Burlington Police Department, myself, two officers, and a sergeant. You will not see all of us in that corner. Uh, we were moving throughout the area. We went through the, the, the park at times. I made at least uh, a walk through the City Hall Park at, at some point during that night. We were on post probably from around 10.30 or 11 o'clock until this incident occurred. Um, but we were rotating, and we had, uh, we, there were instructions to visit, when possible, the, uh, the Simons gas station at the corner of Winooski and Bank because of previous incidents that have occurred there. There were instructions to be around the perimeter of City Hall Park on St. Paul. We have bars that are on St. Paul and Maine. We have bars that are on Church and Maine. We have bars that are on Maine and Winooski. We have bars that are on uh, Church Street between Maine and uh, College. And that was the region in which people were. And I don't believe that you will see any video that shows all of those 10 regions resources in one place. That is not how we deploy. Are they, are they in groups at times? Yes. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, those groups are, are people who are at work, who are watching a scene and talking with one another, talking with members of the public who come up and talk to them. Again, the uniform experience until this incident uh, of that night was similar to the uniform experience of August 13th. It was a, uh, an incredibly a uh, strong voice of support and uh, of appreciation for these troopers and these officers being out on that corner and a sense of thank you for being out here. We're glad to see you um, and a, uh, a real a voice of, of appreciation. Okay. So uh, then we can move into some discussion about these other incidents. Um, so if you want to click forward, please, Shannon.
There we are. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, gunfire incidents. I've defined gunfire incidents before. We will post this online for, for everyone uh, who's, who's trying to zoom in on a, on a video screen, which is difficult. Um, the, uh, since 2012, there have been a total of 64 gunfire incidents. I've defined gunfire incidents before. A gunfire incident occurs when we have probable cause that a firearm was discharged and reasonable suspicion that it was discharged in a criminal manner. Probable cause that a firearm would discharged would mean that we have eyewitnesses, we have ear witnesses, we have video, we have recovered ballistics, some combination of those kinds of things. We have an injured party who's got a firearms injury. Uh, some combination of those things would equal probable cause that a firearm was discharged. Reasonable suspicion that it was discharged in a criminal manner would include uh, either, pr either witness statements that it was being fired at someone else or that they were being fired between parties, uh, indications that it was fired in the air in a crowded location. That is a reckless discharge um, and is in criminal. What we would exclude from these would be incidents, incident, excuse me, instances of hunting discharges, which do occur at times in the city, particularly in the, in the intervale and in the New North End out over the lake during bird season. Uh, we would exclude suicides by firearm from this. And in certain instances, we would exclude an accidental discharge uh, from handling if a person was cleaning a firearm or, or working with it and, and had an accidental discharge. Sometimes we might include that. We had an instance in which a person was mishandling a firearm and shot himself in the leg and ultimately made a false report that he had been shot by a uh, person of color who had fled, uh, we uh, charged that individual and we do count that as one of our gunfire incidents. Um, since 2012, there have been 64 gunfire incidents. And in that time, there have also been 330,838 incidents. So that's one in 5,200 incidents. It's 0.019% it's uh, of incidents. So 0.019% of incidents in that time period are gunfire. It is an incredibly fractional component of what we do. It's incredibly important. Since 2020, however, there have been 49 gunfire incidents. And in that time, there have been 62,174 overall incidents. One in 1,269 incidents, therefore. That's a big change. To go from one in 5,200 to one in 1,200 is a big change. But it's still an infinitesimal proportion. It is 0.079% of all incidents. 0.079%. Um, so these are very small numbers. But year to date, compared to the year to date five year average of the preceding years, uh, that is 2017 through 2021, the gunfire in 2020 is up by more than 350%. That is alarming. It is tremendously concerning to us, and as I've stated before, it is a tremendous drain on uh, our capacity to look at these. More importantly, it is tremendously impactful on our community, on people who are shot. We can't even begin to think about the impact uh, that that causes for a family, for people who are left behind, uh, for, for neighbors, for a general sense of safety. Um, of the 49 incidents, uh, and I think you can move forward, please, thank you. So here's a picture of all those incidents. Uh, the code is this. If it is white, it is a gunfire incident. If it is light blue, it's a gunfire incident where we know they were shooting at one another, but no one was struck. If it is dark blue with an X through it, that is an uh, a incident in which a person was struck, i.e. a shooting. And if it's red, it is a gunfire homicide um, with a person killed. Uh, again, the 2022 figures are only through September 8th, um, so year to date. Uh, you can see uh, the top box, uh, the top graphic shows the incidents as they occurred throughout the year with the incident on the far uh, left being the first incident of the year and the incident on the far right being the last incident of the year or in the case of 2022, the most recent, I hope the last, but I am not going to hold my breath. The bottom chart rejiggers it to show the kind of incident because there have been statements that these gunfire incidents are not important uh, it's a made-up category. We should only be thinking about shootings or, or homicides. Well, it's up that way as well. And I completely reject the notion that these incidents are not important. Gunfire incidents are important irrespective of, of whether someone gets struck. And we put as much investigatory resources we can into the cases irrespective of whether someone is struck. That said, a homicide, a shooting, absolutely we take those uh, with additional seriousness. Um, of the 49 incidents since 2020, about 20 incidents have been shootings where a person was struck or killed. And about 11 of these uh, 49 incidents 
have no solvability factors at this time. They are incidents in which we found casings at a location or we have ear witnesses. In other words, we have that probable cause, we have that reasonable suspicion that it was criminal and that it wasn't hunting, it wasn't a suicide, it was a discharge in our city limits. But what we don't have is any additional solvability factors. Um, this is another way of looking at all those incidents and here I'm back to the entirety of the uh, 64 uh, cohort, all 64. Uh, these are the days of week that they occur and the time of day that they occur. So that's the 24-hour schedule starting at, at 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and that is the seven days of the week. Um, unsurprisingly, the weekends have a, a fair amount of activity, and unsurprisingly, the wee hours are when these things do occur. Um, back to our 49 cohort, that is the incidents that have occurred since 2020. Uh, 11 of them, as I said, have no solvability factors. Uh, 11 of them have taken place in or around downtown and the downtown core uh, and within the five hour window of bar closing. Um, and about 22 incidents have involved young Burlingtonians who are known to police for pre-existing criminal associations. And those people may be associated in those 22 incidents as perpetrators or as victims or as suspects or in some combination of, uh, thereof. So of the 23 incidents in 2022, and I think you can move forward. Yeah, so this is a, a picture of them, uh, of all incidents in the past three years, the, that is the, the 49 cohort around the calendar to see whether or not we have patterns here. And as again, do we have patterns in that they appear more often on weekends? Yes. Do we have patterns in when they occur during the year? Not really. The, the rarity of these events despite the fact that it's more frequent than it ever has been, makes uh, pattern determination difficult. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so of the 23 incidents that occurred in 2022, about six do not have any solvability factors. 12 have involved a person being struck, and three of those have been murders. We've made 12 arrests in those 23 cases. Excuse me, 13. We've made 13 arrests in those 23 cases of 2022. And in seven of the cases in which someone was struck, we've made arrests. Um, I think that, I hope, is, is our takeaway for this. We are making progress on these cases, particularly in cases where people are struck, particularly in instances uh, where, we have, uh, where we have solvability factors present. So in other words, uh, we have witnesses. We have a knowledge that people were shooting at one another. We have an injured party. Um, the, the work that the Detective Bureau has done on these has been uh, thorough, constant. They are working at, at full capacity, um, but we take these greatly seriously and we want to do more. Uh, and I think that that is going to be something that we're going to be talking about uh, further in, in the coming weeks. I, I believe the mayor has some ta uh, something to say about this as well. We've been in discussions with the state. We are in discussions here with partners uh, at the ATF, partners at the state's attorney's office, partners in other law enforcement agencies. Um, we are, are uh, putting together new ways of working with one another, of informing each other about uh, gunfire when it occurs. It doesn't just occur in Burlington. There have been incidents in, in Colchester and in Winooski and in other towns as well. And sometimes these things take us to other places. This case did take us out of town as well with regard to search warrants, et cetera. So um, uh, with regard to working on, on narcotics, which at least in this case seems to have been a, a contributing factor. And that too is going to involve work with additional federal partners and with the state as well uh, and their, their narcotics teams. So I don't know, sir. Thank you, Chief, for, for laying that out. Um, it's uh, uh, my sense the public is uh, really eager for an overview um, like that. Um, when I'm uh, having the public coffees I do, interacting with members of the public, uh, there's, there's a lot, a great deal of interest in, in understanding what's going on. And I think as a result, um, uh, as you just heard, of the outstanding work of the Detective Bureau, we both have made considerable progress towards holding people uh, accountable that have been committing these gunfire incidents. Um, we also have a greater understanding of what's going on. There are, is also greater clarity uh, about uh, at least a couple of the major drivers um, of, uh, of, this, uh, of this spike in gun, in gun violence. Um, to bring this fully to an end, and uh, while I think we're here um, noting a, a significant arrest and a three significant arrests over the last three weeks, um, I don't think we're done with this. Um, I, I think we have more work to do. We know we have uh, 
multiple open cases that uh, work is ongoing on um, to uh, to to bring this really uh, unfortunate chapter uh, in in the city to a close. I think we do need several things, and there's been allusions to it all, all, so far. But I'll, I'll I'll summarize it further. Um, we. Um, uh, we need more of this interdepartmental, uh, interagency collaboration. That's the that's the Vermont way. I've seen it happen a number of times over the last decades when we, when we do have um, a uh, emerging uh, public safety incident, the various law enforcement agencies that have responsibility, overlapping responsibility, come together, uh, coordinate, um, uh, share information. Um, and uh, uh, through those combined efforts, um, no, don't just add together all of our work. The, there's some multiplying effect. There is uh, real uh, efficiencies and, and uh, synchronicity that comes from that kind of work. And that's what's needed here. It's now it's needed more than it's ever been, um, given the uh, really significant um, resource constraints that virtually all uh, law enforcement agencies in Vermont are facing. We need that collaboration happening in terms of um, patrol presence, and I am thankful for the state's uh, help on a couple of nights. We, we do need more of that, and we need um, uh, we are going to need more help from other agencies with specific uh, capacity and at various times until we were able to rebuild this police department, something we're also working very hard on, um, but we know is going to take some time. Uh, there needs to be collaboration on the on the prosecutorial front, and, and uh, it is a welcome that um, the state's attorney is working with federal prosecutors to uh, develop strategies and make sure we are bringing all of our, our prosecutorial um, uh, capacity to bear. Um, there needs to be greater investigatory uh, collaboration as well, and um, that is uh, a, an area where I think if we saw uh, even more of it, um, we would even accelerate the kind of progress that we've been talking about today of the Detective Bureau uh, moving forward. So, um, thank you all for being here. We, we take some, you know, we're happy to take some questions on on this uh, on this sort of the broader trends if, if there are any. Uh, so, Mayor, for you. Um Obviously, this Friday, Keep Vermont Safe is planning a you know, forum discussion, public open, um, right inside City Hall to kind of talk about this sort of stuff, talk about the data. And I guess just your reaction to that and, um, you know, I guess, does the City Council need to do something like that? Do they need to take this up on the agenda, this overall trend? Yeah. So, um, and I see we're joined by one of our city councilors, Council Joe, Joe McGee is here. Um, listen, I mean, we, we've had a lot of conversations in the city council about the challenges we're facing with public safety. Um, I would say since last October, there's been a lot of alignment between the administration and the council about what we need to do with respect to the police department, with respect to rebuilding uh, our public safety presence, with respect to, uh, for even you know longer than that, there's been alignment about um, expanding our, our alternative resources. Uh, so, you know, I, I um, I, uh, I think there's a lot. I, 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 uh, I welcome public discussion uh, of this. I do think um, we have had, uh, I, I will say, um, I do think, I, I'm certainly looking ahead, I'll say this, looking ahead to the next legislative session, um, there, there does need to be a change in the kind of public conversation about what is going on. For years, um, rightly, we have been uh, focused um, on uh, ways that we can improve law enforcement and, and uh, come closer to achieving our 21st century law uh, policing ideals. Um, and a great deal of effort has been made by this agency and, and, and many others in that direction. Uh, that has dominated the public discussion of public safety for years. What we are facing now is there has been a dramatic shift since 2020. We are facing challenges that certainly we have never seen since uh, uh, in the time that I've been uh, in, in this role. Um, and we need the public discussion and focus and legislative focus to, to shift accordingly. And uh, certainly I, I will say, I think as we uh, get ready to lead into the 2023 uh, legislative session, um, I will be pushing for, and I know, um, uh, many other municipal leaders and uh, law enforcement leaders um, and 
advocates in various communities will be looking for legislative change as well. I'm not ready to announce the agenda today, but I, I do welcome a, I, I think we have to have a lot more community conversation about it. Sir, another quick question for the chief. Um, given uh, Crawford's criminal background, um, you know, with eight other felony charges, I believe, was this an individual who was prohibited from having a firearm? And do we know where that firearm came from when he bought here in Vermont? Was it brought with him from New Jersey? So not charges, convictions. I believe there was a, a large number of convictions out of state for felonies that would indicate a person is prohibited from uh, having a firearm. Uh, the investigation into these is, is something that's still ongoing. Um, the, uh, there were firearms recovered in, uh, in his possession or is it in his immediate constructive possession. Um, so, you know, that is going to be another potential avenue of, of exploration. Um, uh, I don't know if you want to speak more to that, but I, I will say that the, you know, what, what's what's key here isn't the fact that he was in felonious possession of a firearm; it's that he murdered somebody in City Hall Park. Um, there's currently a warrant, I believe, investigating the bail to appear in court uh, pending some of those narcotic sales. Is that going to affect what happens here at all? I'm not very familiar with how that might um, impact, like I guess, the trial or anything. Is sure. I think that, that's a great question. He Sorry, asked about the, the fact that there's a pending uh, warrant for him elsewhere. How does that impact what we have here? Yeah, so when somebody has a, a fugitive warrant, we do file the paperwork often as a fugitive and kind of hold it and then usually work with that jurisdiction to determine who's who kind of is going to go first. Um, you may recall with Alfred Wisher's case, you know, we had filed that homicide charge against him and he got picked up in Georgia on a very serious offense they kept him until their case resolved and then returned him to us on our fugitive warrant so we will essentially do the the opposite in this case we would hold him um, on our homicide because it essentially trumps uh, their possession of drugs or sale of drugs whatever it was out of new jersey if they determine that they want to go forward with it but that's how it usually works is we talk with that jurisdiction to determine who's going to keep the person um, so right now we'll keep, we will be keeping him. In the case of, of, uh, of Alfred Wisher, he had murdered Cayenne Jones. However, Mr. Jones did not die immediately. And in fact, at the time of Wisher's apprehension out of state, Mr. Jones was not yet dead. And so that also sort of played into the fact that he was retained by the state in which he was apprehended until their charges were, were dealt with. And in the interim after that, uh, Mr. Jones did die. It's more of a trend question. Um, you know, we've talked about the involvement of drugs and narcotics in, in some, if not most of these shootings. I mean, is there an avenue that can be explored, you know, in, in terms of, of the drug trade that might help to minimize, you know, reaching for a gun and shooting, or is it just a, a kind of a one-off? Does I, that make sense? No, I guess I'm a little unclear on the question. I, I'm sorry, so I can't. So with, um, you know, a lot of these shootings involving some form of narcotics, is there any effort by the department to attack that as a, you know, a precursor for a lot of these shootings? So uh, I, I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, that narcotics plays a role in a, a large percentage of them. I think narcotics is incidental to them. I think there's narcotics uh, involved in them. I, this uh, right now appears to be one of the cases that, uh, frankly, is likely to have a narcotics angle once we're able to investigate it more. I think there are other instances, particularly those that involve people who are, are local to our community, that involve relationship issues between people uh, more so than narcotics, although many of those individuals do in fact traffic in narcotics uh, at some extent, to some extent or another. But what we're, we've seen so far has not been about uh, for example, protecting trade or uh, about, you know, uh, to, to maintain territory around uh, narcotics trafficking. Um, again, I, this, this may end up being an exception to that. That said, yes, of course we are continuing to investigate narcotics to the best of our ability. Um, we have, uh, we do continue to have a, a narcotics unit within our detective bureau. Um, that is something that may not be sustainable forever, depending on how staffing continues to move, but we have maintained it thus far. Why? Because A, our community cares about open air drug dealing, about the uh, ancillary effects of, uh, on quality of life that, that stem from drug use and, and drug sales, uh, and B, because the information that we get about 
bad actors in our community is, is tremendously enhanced by the work that gets done in a narcotics unit. Um, there are crossovers between people, and even when bad acts like shootings are not directly related to the narcotics trade, they involve people who are associated with that trade. For the, for the mayor, you mentioned uh, expanding collaboration. What has been limiting that collaboration? Well, I, I do think we need more collaboration. Uh, we. Um, I think we need some kind of interagency task force to be working on this issue the way we've seen over the last decade with respect to, at one point, the, the, the distribution of uh, opioids, the legal distribution of opioids. There was another task force we were involved with that involved human trafficking. Um, I think these task force, uh, forces create real, real value. Uh, again, have sort of a multiplier effect, not just an additive one in terms of all this work that is going on from these agencies with overlapping authorities. The chief has been working for some time to try to uh, assemble a task force. I think uh, this is coming at a moment when everyone is feeling pressed for resources and constrained. Many, you know, it's not just a Burlington phenomenon where resources are down. Um, and uh, it has been difficult to organize it, but from my perspective, it's got to happen and it's got it's it's past due and we. Uh, and I know Alex shares this feeling. We, we look forward to an uh, announcement there soon. Um, uh, other, uh, you know, I, I, we have had direct communications with the state um, that uh, the uh, single biggest factor that would accelerate this work and we think bring this spike in gun violence to an end faster would be if this outstanding detective bureau we've referenced numerous times had more capacity. Um, we have five detectives who are uh, putting the majority of their time uh, into these gunfire incidents uh, to the exclusion of, of other important work that needs to be done. Um, uh, we have open cases, as we've been discussing. Uh, I want those cases closed as quickly as possible. We've had direct requests to the state uh, for assistance in this. They face their own resource constraints as well. They've been unable to, to fully support that at this point. Um, we have seen the release of uh, a 10-point public safety plan from the state that um, uh, I think uh, uh, we appreciate that there's been some strategic level work done. We're looking for assistance that makes an impact on the ground, and uh, uh, we're going to keep talking to the state about that. Has the state expressed this? I, I heard the governor say on the radio not long ago that you know, there's this opinion that Burlington flows are to some extent self-inflicted. I sure hope not, Derek. I mean, I can't, you know, I can't speak for what the barriers might be out there. I, I would say uh, Burlington is Vermont's largest city. Issues that are taking place in Burlington are Vermont issues. This is something we need to be uh, collaborating on, working together on to resolve. Um, and I think making progress here will have, uh, will have benefits more broadly than simply in Burlington. Twenty-two incidents, not twenty-two individuals. I think it's a fair question, an important question, and one that we do need to be asking ourselves if, uh, if I'm understanding it correctly. I, you know, we're lucky, we're very fortunate in Burlington to have um, uh, both within the school district as well as within our nonprofit community a number of really outstanding agencies that work with our, uh, our, our youth and, and work with uh, kids from, uh, from all backgrounds. And I think there's lots of opportunities that are available here in this community that are not available elsewhere. Um, I do think as we come through, it's a really sad thing, right, to, to be standing here and to be 
communicating that really what needs to happen to bring this unacceptable, intolerable, we all agree on this level of violence to an end, is we need more, uh, we, need, we, need, we need more arrests, we need more incarceration. That is what needs to happen now. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not where any of us want, want this uh, to, to end up. Um, and it does represent, at some level, um, a uh, community failure that we have gotten to this point. And I, I feel that particularly as we, uh, as we move through this period and analyze what is happening here and take stock of it, I, I, it is my understanding of the number of the people that we have had to arrest in recent weeks uh, or you know, during this period um, are, are individuals who there's been concern about for a long period of time and that numerous efforts were made to get additional kind of uh, assistance and support. It's not a narrative I frankly understand well. I think it's one we're all going to have to dig into together. Um, but I think it's important work to do because, you know, this is, this is not, uh, this, we don't want to see this kind of violence. We don't want to be left where our only recourse left is uh, arrest and incarceration. And um, that's not what this community wants. It's not what any of us want. And uh, I think we got to examine how we got here. No, it can't function normally with that. Um, and so there would have to be drastic changes made to uh, our dispatch. We're looking into that right now. Um, the, uh, the, four, the resignations, excuse me, the resignations that have been submitted um, are things that we are seeing if there are ways potentially to, to reverse that. And if not, then we will be looking to uh, bring in other resources in order to address the gap. But irrespective of what we are able to do, you know, that's an, uh, an office that is supposed to have 12 uh, persons. Arguably, it, that even 12 was, was relatively narrow staffing-wise, but uh, it's supposed to have 12, currently has seven, really has six. And if these resignations go through, as you said, it would have uh, potentially four. Um, you know, where, how we change is, is something that we're currently looking into. If, if there are two people on, on shift at any given time, typically? Uh, uh, there's supposed to be at least three. Yeah. There's supposed to be at least three. You have two who are working the police desk and one who works the fire desk. Now, fire's call volume is approximately a third of police call volume. Um, and uh, there are obviously many more, uh, you know, we've, we've only uh, added to the role of dispatcher with regard to expanding the number of resources that we have, not the number, <laughs> the type. We've expanded the type of resource that we have available to us and the role of resources. Um, and so really, two is, is not a functioning uh, office. And right now, having two in there is very difficult. Um, we consider that to be critical staffing when there are only two, and we are in critical staffing far more than is comfortable. And how does this uh, staffing situation extend to beyond dispatch? What about the police department and detectives and different divisions? Uh, the, are some of the constraints you are feeling because of workforce issues? Click forward. Mm -hmm. So that's our current staffing, um, and uh, that's uniform sworn officer staffing. Uh, we are also, and so detectives are, are incorporated into this number. You see there a nice uptick for the 1st of September, first in quite some time. We have three new recruits at the Vermont Police Academy. Um, but I have already received resignations uh, from active officers that will go into effect this month, and I will be back to, uh, to 61, possibly 60 by the end of September. So when I remake this graph at the beginning of every month, this is the, the state uh, and the first of each month, um, and so, for example, those, those recruits were hired in August, but they don't get registered until September 1st. On October 1st, I fully anticipate that this will be down where it was, if not one lower. Uh, that's the state of staffing for the uniform part. Uh, we are allotted 12 community service officers. That is uh, through uh, the great collaboration with the uh, city council uh, in, in achieving a new budget that the mayor worked tremendously hard to get. Um, that new budget allows us to have a total of 12 community service officers. We currently have six. 
That new budget allows us to have a, a total of six community support liaisons. Those are our mental health workers. Uh, they are social workers trained in uh, houselessness, in substance use disorder, in mental health. Uh, we are allowed to have six. We currently have three. So we are working to hire those as well. Um, and then the city council also reversed its decision of 2020 in, in late 2021 and authorized the department to be at 87. Uh, again, this is where we currently are. Getting back to 87 is our goal and is the, the key cornerstone of the rebuilding plan that the mayor and I articulated. It's a key component of why we got the contract that the city council approved, which is really one of the best contracts in the state for police, uh, incredibly strong. Um, but to build back up, to build from that cliff, merely saying uh, you're not 74 anymore, you can be 87, does not achieve that number. And m merely making a budget and, and offering a contract, those are really important, but the next step is the hiring. We've had that budget, we've had that contract for a few weeks now. Um, we have had the budget for two months now. Uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we can start digging in. That uptick is, is a sign, but as I said, it may be washed away by other kinds of attrition in the meantime. So uh, it's a, a cliff that we need to climb. We have to climb for the sake of our community. Um, and uh, it's one that we want to climb. And clearly, you know, there is support in the community for that from the police commission, from the city council, certainly from the mayor. Uh, and we're working to make that happen. But right now, the staffing is pretty da is pretty down. We again, we're we're more than half down in, in dispatch. We are more than half down in the CSLs, more than half down in the CSOs. And uh, although we're not quite half down for officers, we are more than half down with regard to the officers who are assigned to patrol. One last question for me is uh, not about this most recent homicide, but about the first one of this year uh, over on Muck Street. Have you been able to make any headway on that? And I know the last there was an update, it was just a photo of an individual walking through a neighborhood. I mean, have we identified that person yet? Uh, where are we at with that? So, you know, we have made a lot of progress on that case. It's, uh, it's progress, however, that doesn't rise to the level yet of, for example, presenting it for charges related to that case. We have made uh, apprehensions of people we believe to have knowledge of the case or associated with the case on other charges. And getting the, the information that we need to make a charge on that murder specifically is something that we have not yet been able to get. Um, we have worked on, uh, on having, and, and the state attorney may want to weigh in on some of this with regard to, um, uh, we've had you know in, formal inquiries where people are required to testify. Uh, we have also done a lot of work with regard to uh, evidence collection and search warrants. Um, but we're, we're looking for new ways to try to jar something loose on that. That's a very important case to us. I don't know if you want to. Sorry. No, I don't have anything else to add. Other, we've just been working really closely with the detective unit. We did do inquests um, and are looking at warrants, doing warrants, doing, they're doing interviews. We're, we're working hard on it, but we don't have enough for probable cause. In terms of just the three arrests that have Uh, so, as I said, you know, of, of the 23 incidents this year, uh, we've made arrests in 13 of those 23. Um, and we've made arrests in seven of the 12 of the 23 that involved people being struck. Uh, you know, that says that there are people that we're still looking for. Again, in some of those instances, we have made progress in ways that I feel the public is currently safe from those individuals, but we have not yet been able to put charges on those individuals uh, associated to the specific act. Um, and that, that, what that means is that there are times where an investigation leads you to a person and, well, let's take, let's take, uh, you know, uh, let's take Mr. Crawford, for example. If we had not had the excellent work that was done with regard to tracking Mr. Crawford's movements and being able to definitively show, uh, certainly within probable cause, that he was the uh, actor in that homicide, what we would have had 
was a warrant in New Jersey. And that would have allowed us to hold him for some period of time while we continued to work on an investigation. That happens at times. For the most part, people who commit gun violence, it is not their first time around the criminal justice system. It is not the first thing that they have ever done. And therefore, there are often other charges that are available to us, other avenues that we have in order to hold people or at least get them under some kind of monitoring that allows us to, to say that, that this public is safe from this individual from the time being, but do we still want to develop the stronger case for the bigger crime? Absolutely. So, so that isn't apropos of any specific case. That's simply a general sort of picture of how it sometimes goes. Okay. Thank you all for being here very, very much. We appreciate your time.